welcome to Ideas of India, a podcast where we examine academic ideas that can propel India forward. My name is Shruti Rajagopalan and this is the 2021 job market series where I speak with young scholars entering the academic job market about their latest research on India. I spoke with Apoorva Bhatia, a PhD candidate in economics at Warwick University. He also has a BSc in economics from the Indian Institute of Technology in Kharagpur and an MSc in economics from the Toulouse School of Economics. We talked about his paper titled Behavioral Voters in a Decentralized Democracy, which is co-authored with Vimal Subramaniam and Sabya Sachi Das. We talked about voter behavior in simultaneous versus sequential national and state elections in India, information overload, rational ignorance models, the bully pulpit effect, and much more. For a full transcript of this conversation, including helpful links of all the references mentioned, click the link in the show notes or visit discoursemagazine.com. Hi, Apoor. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. You know, you have a super interesting paper with Vimal Subramaniam and Sabja Sachi Das on studying the effect of simultaneous elections in India. As you know, I mean, the listeners know India is a federal system. We have parliamentary, state and local elections and sometimes the cycles coincide. And what you study is that during those cycles, when there's a general election and a state assembly election simultaneously in certain parliamentary constituencies and assembly constituencies. And what you find is kind of remarkable that, you know, when there's is a simultaneous election versus a sequential election, the likelihood of the same party winning increases by 21%. That's a big effect. So can you tell us more about why this happens? So in this paper, we study how synchronization of elections affects the voters' behavior. And is it big enough to significantly affect the electoral outcomes? And maybe let me make it clear for the listeners, what is synchronization of election? So that means holding the elections for the different tiers of the government on the same day. Currently, there is a policy motivation to study this question and there is an economic motivation to study this question. Let me go into both of them in details. So in the policy motivation, the government of India has a proposal to hold the synchronized elections. And the Niti Aayog and the Law Commission of India are all in favor of it. The proposal's core rationale is that elections are expensive to the exchequer and multiple elections create disruptions to the governance as the bureaucracy is occupied with election management. This policy proposal is not just in India, but even the European Union and South Africa are thinking about it. So over here, we ask a more fundamental question. So does synchronization of elections affect how voters vote? And what are its implications? Now, on the economic motivation side, there are two different strands. So the first is that theories of decentralization point to the economic and governance benefits for having multiple tiers in the democracy. And these theories presume that voters are sufficiently sophisticated to make decisions in this manner. But if the voters cannot behave in this way, it affects the degree of effective or de facto decentralization in the economy and the benefits that can result from it. The second sort of economic motivation strand is that there is a growing literature that studies the cognitive limitations and behavioral biases in the elections, such as voters prefer to vote for the winning candidate, they are sometimes overconfident, they are inattentive to information, but this evidence studies how individual voters vote in a single election, but almost all of the democracies today are decentralized. So we study this question of synchronized elections and how it affects the voter behavior. We set up a model to illustrate cognitive constraints voters face during simultaneous elections. And we use, as you were saying, the natural variation in the electoral cycles in India to empirically test the model's predictions. And we have three sets of results. So the first is that synchronized elections increase party salience among voters. By party salience, I mean when the voters have to think about party affiliation or the personal characteristics of the candidates, they're more likely to focus on the party affiliation of the candidates. The second is that there is an increase in likelihood that the voters vote for same party across both tiers. In the Indian context, that means when a voter goes for voting, they vote for the same party for the Lok Sabha seat and the Vidhan Sabha seat. The third result that we find is that there's an increase in probability that the same party wins both constituencies. This increase is about 
I want to understand a little bit more about what is your theory or model of the Indian voter? What is going on with them, either with the assembly election or the parliamentary election or when both of them happen in a synchronized way? So we don't have a fancy theory for how the Indian voter votes. We are taking a very simple theory of how the decision making process is for a voter when they go for the elections. To understand how the simultaneity of election changes voter behavior, we basically use the timing of election across tiers to understand the vote behavior changes. So we set up a model where once the voters are voting for both the tiers on the same day and once they are voting with a gap, then there is a gap between the two elections. So we set up a voting choice model with two parties and the voters have to decide on who do they vote for. And they have the party affiliation of the candidates. They can think of their personal characteristics of the candidates, such as what is the work that they have done? What is the cost? What is the religion? And they give some weights to these different characteristics of the candidates when they're deciding whom to vote for. So we try to understand how this decision-making rule and the weights for different characteristics change when the elections are synchronized or when they are held sequentially. So now in this setting, we take the party affiliation as a characteristic which is more easily available. You know which parties are contesting, so you know the parties. But the information on the personal characteristics of the candidates is more difficult to acquire. So when the elections are sequential, this decision is split up and the the voters vote based on their characteristics. But when the elections happen on the same day, a joint decision has to be made on how to vote. And when that happens... Our model gives three predictions. So the first is that parties become more salient when the elections are synchronized in the voters' decision-making rules. So party gets more weight in their decision-making rule. The second is that the fraction of voters who vote for the same party also increases in simultaneous elections. And the third is we find that probability that same party wins both elections is higher when they are held simultaneously than when they are held sequentially. So this is in one sense like a very classic and canonical model of rational voter ignorance, right? So this is, you know, your Anthony Downs kind of the origins of public choice. The voter is rationally ignorant because there is a very high cost to assimilating information about, as you mentioned, the details of the candidate, the party affiliation, so on and so forth. And the benefit is fairly low because the probability of overturning an election because of a single vote, because of an informed voting choice is incredibly low. So in a sense, is this just like the most obvious result in the sense that none of this is surprising? And I mean, you're going to have a marginal effect if they are held in a simultaneous way. But it's not like the Indian voter was doing a lot of research or any voter is doing a lot of research when it comes to non-synchronized elections, right? Yes. So essentially, I think what you're thinking is that is it sort of an information overload story that the voters are voting in the same way or... Is it something else? And what we are saying here is that there is cognitive constraints that the voters face. And this cognitive constraints versus information overload hypothesis, we try to understand in our framework through the empirical findings. So we use the Lokniti CSDS surveys to understand the voters' decision making when they are held in a synchronized way or in a sequential way. Sorry, simultaneous and sequential elections. So we take the questions from the survey and we try to understand the voter behavior. We take the question, what is the most important issue of the election? In the survey, the responses could be what their issue was. And we classify that issue as a national issue if it falls under the central government according to the constitution. And if it becomes an issue of the state government, if it falls under the state government's area of working. So let me take an example. Maybe that becomes clear. So if the voter says the most important issue of the election is national security, then that's a central government issue and the voters are thinking of national issues. But if the voter is thinking of the hospitalization or medical care as the most important issue, then that's the responsibility of the state government. So we try to understand first how the election issues change. Most important issue of the election changes when they're held in a synchronized way. And what we find is that synchronized election doubles the probability that the voter says, I don't know what is the main election issue. So what we see here is that synchronized election dramatically increases confusion about the election issues. Now, this confusion could be through the information overload hypothesis or the cognitive constraint. And we delve into it further and we try to understand if the confusion is explained by the voter characteristics. So essentially trying to understand if female voters are different, if older or younger voters are different, 
how the voters are behaving differently by their educational background or social category and we don't find any of these characteristics explains this confusion so the confusion is equal for all voters so let me go in a different direction so you're right in that you don't find much difference in voter characteristics based on gender and caste and so on and so forth but are you maybe looking in the wrong place in the sense that is there a different explanation coming from political party behavior that could explain it so you know there is a cost to elections and campaigning and so on right and when there is a party that could have the possibility of winning both the assembly election seat and the national election seat then it might strategically allocate more resources it might fly in more vips because you know you're kind of you know hitting two birds with one stone so to speak right does the party salience come because of the supply side effect from the effort that the party is putting in and not just what the voters are doing no so we don't find any supply side changes when the elections are synchronized to understand this we used the data set available from the trivedi center of political data they've assembled amazing data set for indian elections and we try to understand the candidate selection strategy through the data so first is we try to understand if candidates running for the first time goes up when the elections are synchronized we don't find that to be the case we don't find any turnout uh, turn coat effects So essentially candidates are changing their parties between two elections. Turn codes don't happen between sequential and simultaneous elections. Also we don't find that the candidates are recontesting candidates. So a candidate is recontesting from the same constituency or from a different constituency within the same state and we don't find that to be happening. The total number of candidates who have lost their deposit in the elections does not change between simultaneous and sequential elections. the total number of candidates who run for the election also is not different between the two and we also look at the share of parties which are fielding candidates so as you were saying you can hit two birds with one stone so it's not the case that the share of party fielding candidates in both tiers change when this happens and importantly this result is also true for both national parties and state parties because the level of funding can be drastically different between the two groups of parties and we don't find the supply side changes to explain the results so you know there's one part of supply side which is talking precisely about the characteristics of the political candidate but the other aspect of supply side in an election is informational right this is basically campaigning right so it might make more sense to bring in the president or the leader or the face of your party to a constituency where you have both assembly candidates as well as a parliamentary candidate and the election happens to be simultaneous so i'm thinking more from a point of view of information because if you say that there is you know a capacity constraint to absorb information and it leads to party salience then maybe the parties understand that and they try to supply greater information to increase party salience right indeed so to understand this effect we try to do a couple of things so one we look again from the survey evidence and we find that the political campaigning is not different so the survey asked the question has a political party visited your house to ask for votes and we don't find that to be different between two elections next most importantly we find that when we change the time window of the gap between the two elections so we're comparing an election which happens on the same day with elections which happened with a gap of 180 days but if we vary that gap to let's say 210 days 240 days 240 270 300 360 480 changing this time window of sequential election does not affect our results so if information was playing a role maybe the time gap would have change the degree of information flow and that could explain the results but that doesn't seem to be happening another question in terms of the information do you think some of it could be just media fatigue right there are only so many column inches in a newspaper or only so many minutes in a prime time news show and it's harder to cover in depth detail both the national general election you know parliamentary seat candidate as well as the assembly seat candidate so there is much less information so there's greater reliance on you know like a heuristic like party affiliation yes so essentially i think what you're suggesting is that it may be there's a choice fatigue that's leading to decision shortcuts and we also test that by understanding if there are coat tail effects now coat tail effects have been prominently documented in the economics and political science literature and by coat tail effects i mean that there is a prominent candidate in one election that attracts the votes for their party or the other seats when they are held sequentially 
So we test it for the star candidates, uh, as we call it, in the coattail effects. So we try to look at if prominent candidates, such as the prime minister candidate or the chief minister candidate, or it's a Sunil Dutt, O.P. Jindal, Shatrugan Sinha, who are contesting for the elections. And we try to decompose the effect that's coming from these coattail effects or the star candidates and the non-coattail effects. But we don't find that the effect is explained by just the coattail effects. And you're not in a position to look at media transcript and, you know, like sort of to textual analysis of newspapers and things like that. That would be a slightly different direction, but that could also provide supporting evidence for your theory. No, so we couldn't do that much. In terms of the time period, we have analyzed between 1977 and 2019. So we analyzed all the elections. And in that period, we've tried to understand how the synchronized elections play affect. I just want to go back to sort of the canonical, you know, rational ignorance voter models, right? One of the weaker versions, right, of that hypothesis is that because this kind of information processing and acquiring is so costly to voters that individual voters will generally choose to remain rationally ignorant, right? A strong version of that hypothesis is that because of this in large elections, voter preferences are not really reflected in political choices and political outcomes. Now, in India, there is another very interesting natural variation, which is that each constituency size is not the same. And I don't mean just the parliamentary versus the assembly constituency. Of course, those are different. I mean, every parliamentary constituency is not the same number of voters as it was at the birth of the republic. This is, of course, thanks to delimitation. And they have to figure this problem out in the next five years in 2026, right? Do you think that the size of the constituency changes this in any meaningful way? That is, if the rational voter model is correct, Right. So if it's an information question and not a cognitive constraints question, then you should see that in larger elections, right, where a voter has a lower probability of flipping the result, you know, you should see more of a particular kind of behavior. You should see more party salience, let me put it that way, versus in smaller constituencies. Have you studied that at all or what do you think about my hunch? Yes. So in that context, I think what you're thinking is that if there is a large constituency that my marginal vote would not make a difference. So maybe let me not go and vote. So essentially the turnout changes. So over here, actually, what we find is that state elections do not experience an increase in turnout when the elections are synchronized. So when the state elections is happening on its own, there is some turnout. But when it is clubbed with the national election, there is no difference in turnout between these two cases. But in the national elections, we do see an increase in turnout. So national election, general election happening on its own has some turnout. But when it is clubbed with the state election, the national election turnout actually is higher. And we find that this increase in turnout is uniform again from the survey evidence we find it's uniform across all individual characteristics so it's not the case that again so women are more likely to vote or younger or older people are voting differently again by caste groups or by education so this turnout changes are uniform across individual characteristics and we find that our main result is again not driven by constituencies which have a higher turnout so this turnout completely cannot explain the effect Yeah, so one part is turnout, but also maybe, you know, you choose to be rationally ignorant and you just show up in a form of expressive voting, but you inform yourself less when you're in a larger constituency because you're not going to change the result, right? So only one part of the cost that the voter takes on is showing up. The remaining is everything you are talking about, which is getting to learn the characteristics and so on and so forth. That would be an interesting thing to study. So I have another question about what might be driving voter behavior that leads to this kind of party salience, which is do the voters perceive that there is some kind of coordination benefit if you have the same candidate at the you know state level and the union level from the same party so they could coordinate better as opposed to slippage do you think that could be driving some of this result no so we analyze it and we don't find that any economic activity changes in economic activity explain this result so we look at both synchronized elections and synchronized representation and we look at different economic activity outcome variables So we look at what is the overall agricultural production in those areas. We look at the gross cropped area. We look at the credit dispersed by the RBI. And we look at the total investment, both from the public and private sources. And lastly, we look at the night lights, which is frequently used as an overall indicator of the economic activity. 
and across all of these outcome variables, we don't find any significant differences, both from synchronized elections or synchronized representation. So essentially any economic benefits that could result from synchronized election does not seem to be there. That really makes us ask the question that are there any benefits to synchronization in terms of decentralization and what implications does it have? And do we really want to play with how the voters vote by changing drastically the way voting elections have been happening in the country? No, I think, you know, landed on one of the very important normative implications of your paper, which is that in the sort of framework of India's, you know, democratic structure in the republic, we have a set of horizontal checks and balances, which is, of course, you know, you have the parliament, you have the executive and the cabinet, and you have the judiciary. But there's also a very clear vertical set of checks and balances, which is, you know, three tiers of government. And some of these vertical checks and balances have been quite important over the years, especially since India walked away from like a very strong form of central planning, right? You've seen, you know, greater amounts of federalism in India. Also, fiscal federalism has started playing a bigger and bigger role, of course, diluted a little bit by the GST. So one of the important normative implications of your paper is that holding synchronized elections would actually weaken the federal structure, because now party salience is going to dominate other effects. Is that a correct reading of your work? Yes, yes, it is in some sense. So because the debate currently is just all about the costs of holding elections across tiers and what are the implications of it. But our paper is highlighting that do we want to play with how the voters are behaving and what implications does it have on the decentralization as well going forward? So, you know, I have a question on long-term voter behavior. Is it a reasonable assumption that as the voting system changes and, you know, it tries to game voter behavior, eventually the voters will also get smarter and they'll know that they are being gamed and these effects will go away? So, in other words, if India does switch to a system of synchronized elections over a period of time, do you think the voters are also going to start changing their behavior to get what they want? I don't know. Sorry. No, that's fine, because this is why I was going back to the earlier question of what is our, you know, model for the voter, right? If the voter is rationally ignorant, then that's not going to be the case. But, you know, if it's only a question of cognitive capacity, right, and there are huge costs to voting in this particular way, then hopefully over a period of time, voters, the media, the entire surround sound that's there in an election will start accommodating for this particular fact of synchronized election, very similar to how it happens, you know, in developed countries. Yeah. If it's okay, I want to also pivot to another question that you've been working on, which is kind of fascinating. So this is the paper where you're talking about a very salient political party or a political leader using what you term their bully pulpit, right, to drive election results. And here you find that there's a very interesting effect of the attacks that happened in India in Pulwama quite recently. And there's been a lot of narrative that that kind of changed the outcome of the election. It led to this kind of big BJP wave. So we know all that, you know, from media reports, and we know that through anecdotal evidence. But can you tell us a little bit more about exactly what is this bully pulpit and how politicians maneuver it or exploit it? So it's a joint project with my colleague from Warwick, Yatish Arya. And we try to understand how political messages from the head of the state or bully pulpit, as the US President Roosevelt called it. So how voters are receptive to the messages, political messages, and how it affects the voting behavior. And we take the focus on India and we try to understand the incumbent prime minister's focus on soldier deaths and secessionist conflicts during the run up to the 2019 general elections. And what we do is we try to exploit the exogenity of the home constituency of the dead soldier. So think of it this way, that 40 soldiers died in the Pulwama attacks, but they all came from different constituencies all across India. So what we do is we try to understand that if a constituency in a state in Haryana gets a soldier death, how do voters in that constituency vote versus some other constituency? And we do this analysis not just for the Pulwama attacks, but actually we take all the soldier deaths which have happened in India since 2004 to study the voter behavior. 
So over here, we have three sets of results in this study. So first, using text analysis of the prime minister's speeches, we find that only the soldier deaths which happened in secessionist regions increased the nationalistic content in his speeches. But if a soldier died from a Maoist conflict, the speeches of the prime minister do not mention offense and nationalistic issues. Second, what we find is that the BJP and the NDA's vote share increased in the constituencies that received the soldier deaths from secessionist regions only. But the soldier deaths from the left-wing extremism or the Maoist conflict had no impact on the voter behavior. So essentially think of it this way, the soldiers are drafted from all across India. The soldiers don't know in which conflict region they might be posted or which soldier might die at what time in which region. And so essentially the shock that any region of India receives from the soldier death is very random in nature. But the voters are only responding to the messages of the bully pulpit, the head of the state, and they vote accordingly. And the third result is that we find also from the survey evidence that the voters are more likely to mention secessionist issues as important in the 2019 elections in areas that had a soldier death. And then they vote for the incumbent BJP and in the NDA party. No, this is really fascinating. So, you know, I have a follow-up question to that. So, you know, one explanation is, as you point out, you know, this kind of bully pulpit effect that is going on. Do the prime minister's speeches reference simply the attack and the fact that soldiers died? Or do they also mention the specific soldier's name and characteristics from that particular constituency? No. So the prime minister's speeches does not mention specifically the name of the soldier or anything. It's the just general speech. And so what we're thinking over here is that, is it an information effect or a memory recall effect? That's what we study in this paper. So let me take an example again. So it's possible that there is an event, a soldier death, and the politician is talking about that event. So it could A, make the voter more informed about the issue, and then they go and they learn more about the issue. What is this conflict about? What has my politician done? And they change their voting behavior. The second is that the voters are not more informed, but essentially it acts as a cue to recall their past experiences and they vote for it. And that's what we find, that it's the memory recall of these events that makes the voter change their behavior. So essentially, when we drop all the soldier deaths which happened just in the Fulmama attack from the analysis, the results still exist. And again, from the survey evidence, the Lokniti CSDS data, we check how informed our voters about these issues and we find that voters are equally informed about the issues but they're more likely to credit the prime minister in the response of the attacks solely in areas which got soldier deaths but not in other areas also local campaigning local political participation does not explain the results so it's not that the parties were strategically going to constituencies where soldier deaths happened so that didn't happen local incumbency did not play a role and the result is again uniform across voter characteristics. What are the other sort of questions you're looking at in terms of political economy of elections or what's the larger research program that you have planned over the next few years? In other projects in my job market paper, I try to understand how enfranchised immigrants affect politicians' behavior in the UK. So international migrants are currently the most extensive and growing disenfranchised group in Western democracies. And the literature has these two links. So on the one hand, immigration has been linked to rise of populism and polarization in the host countries. But on the other hand, the evidence also suggests that immigrants' naturalization leads to more integration. But the issue is that this process takes many years. And in the US, actually, it can be decades for many immigrants. And in response, in Europe, in Sweden and Switzerland, there have been referendums in the recent years to enfranchise foreign-born non-citizens after a few years, much before naturalization is possible. So in my job market paper, I study the unique context of the UK, where immigrants from Commonwealth countries and Ireland have the right to vote as soon as they come into the country, but while the remaining immigrants are not enfranchised. I do text analysis of the parliament speeches, and I look at the voting behavior on the bills. And what I find is that when there is more enfranchised immigration, the politicians are spending more time in the parliament talking about immigrants. They're also talking positively about the immigrants. 
but at the same time, they're voting to increase immigration restrictions. So overall, I find that enfranchisement leads to a higher political engagement of the immigrants and the politicians are now responding to it. But still, because the immigrant community is small and there is a small voting bloc, there is an anti-immigrant sentiment among the natives. So the incumbents are compensating for their actions for enfranchised immigrants by restricting future immigration. Yeah, so basically it's not a large enough group to swing the voting outcome, right? That's really what's driving this result. So if it became a larger group, it would swing the vote, which is also sort of, you know, the push and pull effect of what natives don't want. That's a fascinating research program. So what have you been up to during the pandemic? So the coping mechanism is exercises. So I've been doing some outdoor running and that's when I've been listening to podcasts. Actually, I got hooked to podcast while now running outdoors and trying to find something to listen to. Just got bored of the music. And over the pandemic, I also got married. So that's also... Oh, congratulations. That's wonderful. Thank you. And now the most important question. What are you binge watching? So I've been binge watching The Crown recently. And I've been enjoying it a lot. I've been in the UK for five years now. And I can sort of relate to it and sort of connected with the story a bit more. Fantastic. No, I really enjoyed the series too. Thank you so much for doing this, Apoor. This was such a pleasure. Thank you for making the time. And I'm really looking forward to all your research in the future. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for listening to Ideas of India. If you enjoy this podcast, please help us grow by sharing with like-minded friends. You can connect with me on Twitter at S. Rajagopal. In the coming weeks, we will feature weekly short episodes with young scholars entering the academic job market discussing the latest research on India. Also check out our new initiative commemorating 30 years of India's market reforms at the 1991project.com. The 1991 Project is an effort to revive the discourse on growth-centered economic reforms in India by focusing on the economic ideas that drove them. In the coming months, we will publish essays, data visualizations, oral histories, podcasts, and policy papers demystifying the Indian economy and the 91 reforms. You can see all the content and subscribe to our newsletter for updates at the1991project.com.